Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session about AWS Proton. AWS Proton is a new application delivery service that we announced at reInvent this year and is now available in public preview. I am Rafa Alvarez. I'm a product manager in the containers team here at AWS and the product manager for Proton. Today, we're going to spend some time going over the product, what we are trying to achieve with it, and how you can use it. In particular, we'll talk about four main points. First, the customer, the customer problem and what we're trying to solve. Second, what Proton is and our vision for this service. Then, I will go into some details about how you use the product and interact with the different resources in it. And finally, some housekeeping items, like how can you access the preview and how you can give us feedback. So let's get started. As I said, we will start with a customer problem, and we are going to do it with an example. Let's pretend that we are starting a new business. We are going to start an e-commerce store. In order for our development to be fast and agile, we're going to use microservices. What this means is that instead of writing all of the code for, it, for, it, for our store, in one single large monolith, we're going to break it down into functional components. For our example, we're just going to use three, as you can see on screen, storefront, inventory, and checkout. Each of these components is fully functional and independent from the others. This is actually very useful for us and for our developers, because it enables us to ship code to each one of them without affecting the others. It allows us to choose the technology and programming language for each one of them independently. For instance, on a screen, you can see that a storefront and inventory are operating in Fargate, whereas checkout is actually running on Lambda. This is good. It makes our developers faster and more efficient, and it gives us a lot of capacity to play around with these tools as we need. However, it's not as simple as it looks. And the reason is that each one of those microservices it's not just the one box we were seeing before. There are a lot of items going in on each one of them. For instance, for the storefront, we need the infrastructure. And it's not just the compute layer, which in this case is Fargate. We also need a DNS route so we can find this particular service, a load balancer. Perhaps we need a database or other type of storage. We need IAM roles to ensure that all provisioning is done according to our rules. You can use tools like AWS CloudFormation to model all of this and have developers take care of provisioning different stacks that mimic that infrastructure for those microservices. But even that is not everything. We also need a pipeline. If we want to be fast and agile, part of the value is that developers can ship code to the repository, and that will be appropriately distributed through the different stages on your pipeline and into production. So we need to set that pipeline up, configure it. We need the architecture now, not just for our production service, but also for the staging one in your pipeline and any other stages that we might have. And finally, we need monitoring and alarms. We want to make sure that if something goes down, if performance degrades, if there are any issue of any kind, we can see it. We can see it soon. We can identify what happened and go look at it even before our customers realize. So what was a simple infrastructure is not that simple anymore. There are lots of moving pieces here to be responsible for. And so a tension arises between the infrastructure team, whose job is to make sure that all of those components meet our standards, and the development team. The infrastructure team, as I said, is looking to standardize. You want to make sure that our needs of compliance and cost are being met by our architecture. So you want to make sure that all of your microservices are meeting those rules. You also want to keep it updated. Your standards might change, new technology might arise, the needs might evolve, and you want to make sure that your infrastructure is evolving with you and you don't have a lot of microservices in the old version that you don't need anymore. On the other side of the equation, developer teams are looking for speed and autonomy. I am focusing on my code. I, I'm ready to go. I want to ship. I don't want to have to wait for anybody. I don't want to have to go through a bunch of hoops to get my code deployed. Nor do I want to become an expert of that infrastructure. It should just work for me. And for that matter, I also don't want to be bothered by updates. I understand that updates are needed in order to keep my infrastructure fresh and 
uh, meeting the standards of the business, but I don't want to be constantly receiving messages saying, you have to run the new template. You have to make those changes. And so our simple business with just three microservices is already dealing with some tension there. You can imagine what happens when we go into a real infrastructure. What we are looking here is the, the topology map of Amazon.com just a few years back. It's not three microservices, it's hundreds. And now we have to figure out for all of these, are they in the latest version? Are they updated? What are they need? Who deployed them? Maybe some of them are not in use anymore, and we can't really tell because there's so much going on. So as an infrastructure team, I look at this as a big problem that prevents me from being able to say with certainty, my infrastructure is meeting our standards, we have everything that we need, and our developers can move fast. When we talk to customers, we found that this problem is typically solved in two or three ways. The first one all the way to the left is centralized provisioning. You err on the side of a standardization. Anytime there is new, a new project that requires infrastructure, the central infrastructure team has to be contacted. Developers will cut a ticket or set up a meeting and will basically talk to them. This is why I, what I need, this is why, these are the changes that have to be made. Then the infrastructure team is going to go ahead and provision the infrastructure, set up the pipeline, set up the rest of tooling and give it to developers. Now this ensures maximum standardization. As an infrastructure team, you control everything, you know who has deployed everything, you can see it all. However, it also limits your speed. The infrastructure team now becomes a bottleneck and you can only move as fast as they can provision that infrastructure. The other side of the equation is a traditional platform as a service. As a developer, I show up with my code in my repo, I enter that and a handful of other parameters. The code gets deployed and the infrastructure is running. Minimum time to wait. However, this doesn't solve for standardization because you are actually using the tools and the infrastructure that the past creator created for you. So you can't really ensure that you're meeting certain standards of compliance or cost. In the middle, there is a solution about building an in-house software to deliver this. The infrastructure team will take care of creating a piece of software that will give them the capacity to define that infrastructure and give developers a very simple streamlined experience similar to a pass to deploy their code. Now, this actually strikes a balance, but the problem is that now you are owning and maintaining a complex software that you will have to keep up to the date, change as needed, adapt as your, as your needs evolve. And as a business, as our e-commerce store, that's not our core competency. This is not what we're here for. The vision for AWS Proton, the role of AWS Proton, is to solve this problem for all customers, no matter how complex the infrastructure is. And so what is AWS Proton? As I said, it's an application delivery service. What this means is that it's sitting between the infrastructure administrators and the development teams during the process of creating that infrastructure. How? Infrastructure administrators interact with AWS Proton by defining and publishing templates for what their architecture looks. This means the whole infrastructure, the pipeline, the observability tooling. Developers on the other side can now log into AWS Proton, find those templates, choose the one that is best for their project, and use it to deploy their application. An AWS Proton, because it's sitting there, it's able to talk to your infrastructure as code tool, like CloudFormation, your CI/CD pipeline, like code pipeline, and your observability tool, like CloudWatch, to set everything up, deploy the code, and leave you with a service that is up and running and ready to be used. And because this Proton is sitting in the middle and is aware of all of these components, both the infrastructure team and the development team can use it to monitor what has been deployed, keep it updated, be it because there is a new standard of infrastructure or because the needs of your project have changed. When we think about Proton, we always think about three core features. The first one is that for developers, it offers a, it offers a self-service infrastructure and co-deployment interface. What this means is that there is just one place that I have to go to as a developer to get my code up and running in production. Proton will take care of all of the pieces. As I said, infrastructure, pipeline, observability. 
as an infrastructure team on the other side, it gives me that centralized management tool. From one single location, I can see everything that has been deployed. By whom? Is it healthy? Is it running updated per my standards? Do I have to change anything? And so I don't have to go chasing developers. Plus, it gives me the capacity to upgrade those things that are no longer in the latest version with one click. Finally, it integrates with third-party services. We do not think you should need to change the tools that you use in order to work with AWS Proton. If you're using CloudFormation or Terraform for infrastructure as code, it will work. If you're using Code Pipeline or Jenkins or GitHub Actions, if you're using CloudWatch or Datadog or New Relic for observability, Proton will work with those. We plan to roll out integration with, with third-party services throughout the PV period and beyond, but it's definitely core to this product to be able to support customers in that matter. Why did we build this product? What is our vision for it? I said before the customer problem, but when we think about this product in the long term, there are three key components that come to mind. The first one is that we want to help our customers quickly and confidently adopt new features and best practices in containers and serverless. These are technologies that are still evolving. New ideas are coming up, and AWS is constantly shipping new ways to use them and make them better for your business. As an infrastructure team, as a customer, when you see those new features, you should feel empowered to use them if they fit your needs. You should not have to spend a lot of time trying to make sure how do I roll them into my organization. The second one is for customers that are moving their workloads to use cloud-based modern application development. There are a lot of complexities in doing this. You have a large set of code that has to move and functionality with it, and you want to make sure that that change is done in a manner that is controlled, that you can ensure the right amount of standardization, of security, that the best practices are carried over. Proton will help you do that too. And the third one is about supporting infrastructure teams. As an infrastructure team, you have a key job. You want to make sure that the tools that you use, the services that you employ, are the best for your business. There are many, many options that AWS offers, and you want to make sure that you are driving value to your company that way. Once you've made that decision, operationalizing it, making sure that it's being rolled out according to your needs, that things are not falling behind, should be streamlined. And that's what AWS Proton can do for you. So let's talk now a little bit about the key resources that this service makes available to you and how we're going to work with them. There are two core concepts in AWS Proton that we should think about, environments and services. An environment in Proton are the shared resources that several of your services are going to be running on. A VPC, a cluster, a shared a load balancer are typical examples of this. Services on the other side represent an individual workload, one of those microservices as I was talking about before, and they run on one or more environments. A Fargate web service, like in our example, or a data processing services in Lambda are, are just examples of this. How do we work with this? Well, at the core of Proton is the template. You have environment templates and service templates. A template represents that repeatable infrastructure and tooling that either administrators or developers are going to be able to create over and over using Proton. So the first step to use Proton is for administrators to define those templates. You can define as many as you need, representing different types of infrastructures. Um, but you're going to go ahead and do that first. The next step is for administrators to create environments. As I said before, an environment is shared across multiple resources. So you're going to have services. So you're going to have several services living in an environment and a, an environment behind it all that was provisioned by the administrator. This gives the administrators the capacity to choose what kind of segment uh, stages in the pipeline are they going to be used or what kind of shared resources and how they're going to be set up for supporting the developers. Once all of this is set up, developers go ahead and create their services. They do so by choosing first what kind of service template they want to use and second one or more environments in which to deploy that service. The deployment of a service in a particular environment is called a service instance. And so typically in Proton, when a developer creates a service, it's made up of multiple service instances 
plus a pipeline that will connect them all with the code repository. To ground, it up, to ground it a little bit, let's think about our example architecture before and see how we would map into Proton. As I said, we had three, type two, three microservices with two types. Two of them were running in Fargate, one was running in Lambda. So the first step is for the administrator to create templates for those services, a Fargate web service and a Lambda web service. Next, we're also going to create an environment template, which for the purposes of this example is very simple, just a VPC. The next element is to create those environments. So in this particular case, we're going to do two, staging and production, two VPCs with their subnets. Now, developers can show up and start creating their services. So for instance, a storefront is created as a service with two different staging, staging and production. Each one of them is an instance and a pipeline that will connect from the repo all the way to the production instance. In the same vein, we have inventory and checkout. And now our full architecture is mapped into Proton. The value, of course, is that if tomorrow we decide to spin up a fourth service, we don't have to set up a lot of pieces. Developers will just be able to show up, choose one of the templates, enter their parameters, and an another one to this list. Let's now go into the details of how this is done. And the first thing to think about is that administrators, their focus is to define standards. I said before that at the core of using Proton are those templates. So we'll talk a little bit about how do you define those templates, how do you register them into Proton, and how do you manage them on an ongoing basis. The last step for an administrator is, as I said, to create environments. So we'll touch on that too. So what's a Proton template? A Proton template is made up of the pieces that will support your infrastructure and code deployment end-to-end. -end. It has four key components. The first one is your infrastructure as code template parameterized. This means that you will take the infrastructure as code that defines all of the architecture of your microservice and select the parameters that developers will need to, provi to provide at the time of deployment. So for instance, and we will see an example, the DNS route for this particular microservice. You parameterize them using Jinja. The second one is a CICD template. Same story. You define your pipeline using a template, and then you're going to parameterize it so that Proton knows what to change in that particular template at the time of creation. The third one is the schema. The schema is how you will tell Proton what information is required from developers at the time of creation. It's written open the, using the open API specification and basically contains a list of all of those parameters with their potential input values. Finally, we ask you to include a manifest, which will tell us all of the other files to look for, and it will ensure that we're not missing any of the core pieces of the template. Let's see an example of how this is done. And we'll go back to our original uh, infrastructure within microservices. For each one of them, as I said, we would need a DNS route. How would we create it in the CloudFormation world? Well, to start, we would need to write one CloudFormation template for each one of those stages in the pipeline. For a storefront, we need one for staging and one for production. And what we're going to do is add a DNS record resource, and in that resource, inject the corresponding DNS route. Storefront, storefront staging. Once this is created, Developers will run these templates and have the two stacks that represent those, those, those two pieces. To do this in Proton, the first step is to create a generic CloudFormation template. Rather than having a specific domain name, we're just going to have a parameter, as we see here, for subdomain. The second one is to create the schema. In the schema, as you can see here, we are telling Proton that for every service instance, we are going to need a subdomain, which is going to be entered in the form of a string. We will see later how this is reflected into the developer experience. But whatever information they give us as a parameter for this input, Proton will inject it into the corresponding CloudFormation template and then run those templates for the developer. The developer is now abstracted away from the details of those, of those components, but they can still provide the information that they need. Once you have created your template in Proton, you're going to put it together in a compressed file and drop it in an S3 bucket. And then you will see the Proton console, as you can see here, to register that template. You give us the information about where the template is available, 
and you provide some additional details like service name and template description that will allow developers to choose the right one for their product at the time of deployment. Once you've registered more than one or more templates in Proton, you can use the Proton experience to see all of them, uh, see their name, description, their versions, and choose one or two to get more details into. Pausing for a second to say, we want to support the customers of AWS Proton with some sample templates that can be used to learn and start practicing. They are well architected, built based on our best understanding of how to use this service, based on our experience and that, that of our customers. They are open source. So anybody can download them or use them to run, run them as they are or change them or use them as a way to learn a bit more about how they are built and how to build their own templates in Proton. They are available on GitHub in the GitHub repo you can see below. And we plan to continuously support and add new ideas to this uh, sample template repo so customers can continue to learn what to do with Proton. One thing that I want to call out for sure is the idea of versions, which I mentioned before a couple of times. As I said, it's critical for Proton to support customers being able to update their infrastructure. And the way you do that is with versions of your templates. So if you change something or if you have to update a template in any way, you don't create a whole new template, you create a new version of an existing one. Once a new version of a template is registered, Proton will allow administrators or developers to move existing services to the latest version. So your infrastructure is always up to date. We, we divide template versions into two categories, minor and major. A minor change is when you update your infrastructure. What this means is that your infrastructure as code template changed something. Perhaps you are adding a new IAM role or adjusting the permissions for one of them. This is fully transparent to developers. They do not have to change anything. And so from Proton, you can make this update with one single click. A major update is when the schema changes. Developers how now, now have to provide a new data point. For instance, maybe you've decided that in your Fargate web service, you need developers to give you the amount of memory that their Fargate instance is going to be using. A major update will be reflected as such, and Proton will allow developers to see what new inputs they have to provide before the update can happen. Proton also uses this notion of a recommended version. What this means is that when you register a new version of a template, test it and make it available to developers, it becomes recommended. Two things. The recommended version is the one that gets deployed whenever a new service of that type is created. And any existing version that is not in the recommended, an existing service that is not in the recommended version will be prompted to move up to it. In the Proton console, you can see all of your templates and you can also see details for each one of them. As you can see in the screen, this includes additional information about it, like the name, the description, the ARN, all of the versions. As you can see here, this one is in version three now and the existing instances that are using this particular template. I call out that service instance one and two are behind by a minor version, so Proton calls it out, and five and six are behind by a major version, so Proton calls that out as well. This allows you, as an infrastructure team, to very quickly see what has not evolved when, with the last version of my infrastructure, what do I have to do to get everything up to date? The final step for administrators is to create environments. As I said, environments represent shared resources for several service instances, like a VPC with subnets, and typically will represent the stages in your pipeline. A VPC with public subnets is production, a VPC with private subnets is uh, staging. When you create a Proton environment, you also provide an IAM role that Proton will use to provision those resources. This is useful because it allows you to ensure you keep very clear what type of resources are available in each type of environment. Let's talk about developers. I think I said it before, but developers, the focus of, for them is on coding. And so we want to give them a streamlined experience where they focus on their code and once it's ready to go, they just have to choose a service, enter the corresponding parameters, and then manage it on an ongoing basis. Let's see how that's done. The first step is to choose a, a, a template. Go to the Proton UI and select one. 
these options that we see in the screen right now were all created by the infrastructure team. The name and description that we entered before show up here. So as a developer, I can read this to choose the one that fits best the needs of my project. Next, I'm going to enter the parameters. Now, all of the parameters that you see in the screen right now were defined by the infrastructure team in that Proton schema that I discussed before. So what Proton is doing is taking that information and turning it into a UI that developers can interact with. Whatever I enter here as a developer will be passed through to the corresponding CloudFormation templates. In fact, we can see the subdomain field here again. Whatever I put there as a developer will be injected into the DNS record uh, resource type in CloudFormation. Once I've created my services, as we did with templates, we do it with services. I can see all of them in one single screen. Name, template that you're using, is their pipeline running, and the, the, list of, the date of last deployment. You can see that we are also calling out once again if any of them is not in the latest version. So everybody knows what's up with things being updated or not. And for each particular service, you can see additional details in the Proton console. Not just name, description, ARN, and other identifying information, but also every single instance of that service that is running, including which version it's running, which environment it's running on, and then health status and pipeline status. Now, both health and pipeline status, Proton asks, as, acts as a hub for this. So it doesn't give you all of the information for each one of them, but it gives you enough data points to be able to identify that something is going on and maybe I need to pay attention. My pipeline failed, I can go to Jenkins or Code Pipeline to see the details. An alarm is going off, I can go to CloudWatch to see the metrics and the status of the alarm. So as a developer or administrator, this allows me to quickly identify, is there something that needs my attention? Do I have to go and take action in any way? As I said, Proton is now available in public preview. We are very excited to get customer feedback and start making changes and changing our roadmap accordingly. There are three main reasons why we wanted to put this product in preview and have it in the hands of our customers. The first one, of course, is getting feedback. It's critical to how we do things here at AWS, and it's super important to us to understand, does this work like you wanted it to? What would you change? What would you do different? The second one is to allow customers to understand how the product works. Does it fit with your vision of what you want to do in the future? Is this the kind of, the kind of service that you would use to empower your deployment of applications? And the third one is that we want to give customers a lot of time to think about, well, if I am going to adopt this service, how am I going to do it? What changes do I have to make? What kind of templates do I have to create? Having this product available allows you to start thinking about those pieces already. And once again, giving us feedback if there is anything else you need to adopt this service. As such, the preview scope for Proton is to allow you to create, deploy, manage, and update templates written in cloud formation and using code pipeline as your CI CD tool. But we have a rich feature of uh, story roadmap of features that we're going to keep working on in the future. Items like health monitoring that I mentioned before, support for third-party tooling like Terraform, Jenkins, or Datadog, tagging of resources. So as an administrator, I can select a particular tag and say that all templates will, of services from a particular template will use it, or all services that are part of an environment will also use it. Support for multiple accounts, the capacity to define that each of your environments is in a different AWS account of all of its resources come with it. And finally, template access control. So giving customers the capacity to choose which development teams can see which templates so that if you have a lot of templates, you can avoid noise. AWS.amazon.com slash Proton is the URL to go see the public preview and start playing with the product. I mentioned before that we are very excited to get feedback on our features. We have a public roadmap on, roadmap on GitHub, github.com slash AWS slash AWS Proton public roadmap. Please go there to see what we're thinking about working on. Tell us how you want it to be done. Give, give us ideas, suggest new features. We are very excited to interact with the community using this tool. 
And I will mention again that we have a public repository of sample templates that anybody can use to see some ideas, gather input, and think about better ways to, your Proto to use Proton in their organization. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of reInvent. One final call out. Uh, down below, you can see an option to give survey, uh, to give feedback on this session. I would really appreciate if you did though. Thank you very much and goodbye.